I'm Daniel Woods. I have kind of two hats. One is at Coalition, where I'm a researcher. Coalition sells cyber insurance and other security services. And the second is at the University of Edinburgh, where I'm a lecturer that's British for assistant professor. So I teach and research cybersecurity. Um, and this talk will be a little bit strange in a way. I would say my main research approach and research interests are in security economics. And I think to kind of explain that to technical people, whereas maybe they're interested in designing the first seven layers of the OSI model, I would say I'm interested in understanding layer eight and kind of redesigning layer eight. So yeah, this talk might seem a bit like a shamanic ritual, but yeah, we're kind of moving in the same direction, which is securing computer systems. So there's kind of three things I really want to get across to you. The first is that software liability is important, and that it actually helps us improve security. The second, and that's the main kind of research component of this talk, is talking about cyber warranties, which is where some InfoSec vendors, some of which are in the business hall, voluntarily accepted liability for the failure of their products, which is really interesting given the wider context of software liability. And then the final part is where we switch gears and we say, OK, so we've looked at voluntary liability. What lessons can we learn when designing mandatory um, liability regimes, as, for instance, described in the 2023 US National Cybersecurity Strategy, where they're talking about shifting liability? So always good to start with a Dan Gear quote. And I think broadly what he's kind of pushing at is the contrast between software, where if something goes wrong, it's hard to get compensation from the vendor who might have designed a kind of insecure product, as compared to, say, cars, where if a car manufacturer produces an unsafe car, victims in an accident could potentially sue the car company. Um, and I think this state of affairs creates bad incentives for producing software. So like I said, we'll do a, a bit of economics here. This is a paper by George Ekeloff, won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1970. And he's talking originally about car markets. But I think we can kind of repurpose it for software security. And the idea here is that software security is a lemons market. So to explain that, let's just introduce two hypothetical software vendors. One produces peachy software, where there's security testing throughout the development lifecycle. There's a vulnerability disclosure policy, maybe bug bounty payments to researchers. The second is a vendor who produces lemons. So they're just trying to ship a functional product that maybe doesn't have the security investment in it. And as anyone in this room who's tried to design secure software knows, there's an overhead to designing secure software. And that is reflected in higher development costs. So the core insight that George Ekeloff had was that if the buyer of that software cannot distinguish between secure and insecure software, the market clearing price will be that of the lemon product. So you can imagine this. Let's say there is a peach vendor who's successfully selling their software at some price above $200,000. All that would happen, all that needs to happen is some entrepreneurial vendor starts producing lemons, and they can undercut the peach vendor. And there's really not much that can be done, because the buyer cannot distinguish between the two. Um, so this is kind of the core idea about, um, of software security as a lemons market. And as a kind of security econo economist who's interested in policy, the core question is, how can we change incentives so that vendors actually build peaches rather than lemons. It's what we all want. And one option is to look at the kind of secure software development steps to get there. The other is to look at the economic and policy incentives. So again, we can go back to Dan Gear, And liability is a key tool in shifting this calculus. Um, so if we go back to the lemons market, let's just assume we change one variable. And here, the vendor would be liable for $1 million for any security breach related to that software product. How does this kind of change incentives? Well, the lemon producer 
maybe they can get away with it. Maybe they can sell this insecure software and you know, charge a higher, achieve a higher profit margin, but they run the risk of yeah, being liable for this $1 million. Um, so at the margin, as you create a stricter liability regime, the um, incentives shift towards producing kind of this peachy software that has security built in. But of course here, we kind of have a continuum, and you can take it too far. Like most hard problems, this is about balancing. If we have no liability, the incentives are to create insecure software. Um, but if we have too strict of a liability regime, maybe the incentives are to not create software at all and instead to you know, farm peaches or whatever. Um, so this is kind of the core balancing problem that policymakers have. And in particular, it's not just along this single dimension of like the size of the liability payment. Um, things are a bit more complicated. So if you look to the National Cybersecurity Strategy, they're talking about shifting liability onto those entities who fail to take reasonable precautions. And then there's just this natural question, what is a reasonable precaution? Where does it come from? Who defines reasonable? Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to get across to you today, that this is inherently a technical question. Although lawyers will write and draft the standard, there needs to be in input from the technical community to get this right. Um, and the kind of core mechanism by which that happens is what's known as a safe harbor. So to anyone who's yeah, not native in the English language, a harbor provides this function for ships, that ships and boats, that if you go into the harbor, you're protected from sea, from storm. Um, and a software, safe, software liability safe harbor provides a similar function. It creates safety and certainty. It's a lot less pretty than this. It would look more like some kind of contractual clause. And of course, there's many different ways of defining this. And I will go into part three of this talk to try and outline some of the design space here but just to have a very simple illustrative example, it could look something like this. It could say, the vendors are immune from liability if they implement a series of secure software development practices. So this is kind of the, the core takeaway here, that liability can help push vendors towards secure software, but there's a technical problem here. And like kind of in designing anything, it's good to learn from the past but what is the historic example we can look to? There's not a historic software liability regime because so far since the 1970s, vendors have avoided liability for software. So that's why it's interesting to look to cyber warranties because rather than the state mandating liability to software providers, this is an example where InfoSec vendors, as I said, some in the business hall, have voluntarily accepted liability. So I just want to kind of tell you the story of that before we kind of pull out some examples. So I actually started at this very conference, Black Hat 2014. So the same conference, so Dan Gear gave the keynote about um, yeah, software liability with this quote about religion and um, software being the only products that are not covered by product liability. But at the same conference, at a much less high profile briefing, Jeremiah Grossman announced that his firm, White Hat Security, who provides security audits for software, will pay up to $250,000 for any breach related costs related to the failure of that software that they've supposedly audited. At RSA the next year in 2015, that is up to $500,000. Um, and of course here, like any kind of contractual issue, terms and conditions applies and, applies, and we'll dive into those a bit later in the talk. Um, but I just wanna take one quick digression because I think it's an interesting historical kind of consideration here. So when Jeremiah first introduced this talk, one of the arguments he was making is that the cyber insurance market was emerging. And he saw this as budget that was left on the table by the InfoSec industry. He thought that this $1.3 billion that insurers are now taking should actually be assigned to, or should actually be spent on InfoSec products. And his argument was that warranties would be a way to kind of you know, shift insurers out of the conversation and keep the InfoSec industry um, at the center of this. And as I don't know how much people in this room follow insurance, but 
Right now, the cyber insurance market is at between 11 and $13 billion, depending on which um, estimate you look at. So history didn't bear this out. Cyber insurance kind of marched on, and InfoSec um, now kind of lives in, you know, alongside it. And if, if people are interested in the comparison between warranties and insurance, feel free to ask that question at the end. Um, but I think, so to go back to the story, so um, this really, the story depends on which InfoSec segment you look at. So this is using Gartner's mapping of um, application security testing. We see that White Hat Security were the only kind of vendors who ended up offering a warranty. So this has kind of two columns. The first is reviews. So I'm using the number of people who bought the product and then made a review as a proxy for market size. And then ratings is the, you know, the one to five stars they give it. So we can see here White Hat are, I think, the seventh biggest um, vendor in this space. But none of the other vendors really introduced the policy. Aztec in 2017 did introduce a $5 million policy Sorry, warranty. I tried to look for it. I'm not sure they exist anymore. Please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong there. But where it gets interesting is if we look to, for instance, endpoint protection platforms. So um, this is, I guess, one of the most saturated security verticals. And you can see that in 2016, Sentinel-1 announced their first warranty, $1 million. Um, this was, again, actually, Jeremiah Grossman had moved to Sentinel-1, and he announces this warranty. A couple of years later, CrowdStrike also announced a $1 million warranty. And then since the pandemic, a bunch of other vendors have now offered warranties. If you take the reviews on the right-hand side as a proxy for market size, 25% of endpoint protection um, platforms are now sold with some kind of warranty attached. Um, and there are terms and conditions. It depends on the subscription, what warranty you get, and we'll look into that. But I mean, this is just kind of a sign of how far things have come. And since even in the last, so this is based on when I did the analysis at the start of Q1 2023, a bunch of other vendors have announced warranties since then. So this has included, for instance, Barracuda Networks. They announced one last week. So this has the potential to change quickly. If the market begins to expect a warranty, we could see buyers kind of looking to vendors and saying, well, why don't you have a warranty? Um, just so I don't know if people are in, yeah, I don't know which space you're in, but I'm trying to at the moment collect all the different warranties. So if I've missed any here, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'll have my contact information at the end. But you can see it's kind of spread across different verticals. We have backup providers providing two warranties, um, endpoint protection, I think it's six. Um, so this is interesting. Um, so it kind of leads us to ask, the first part said that liability is a solution to the lemons problem, to the problem of the lemons market. So is it the case that cyber warranties solve the lemons problem in InfoSec? Another way of framing it is the kind of snake oil salesman problem. And I think there are two core objections and criticisms here. The first is that there are just better ways to spend money than on a warranty program. Why don't you take what you would invest in the warranty program and instead invest it in a bug bounty program, something that will find vulnerabilities and improve the software? Fair obligation, we'll go into it in a sec. And then the second objection is that warranties are sales tricks. Um, and we'll go into that as well. I think the second objection is a bit more valid. So again, like I said, I'm, a, I'm an economist. And I think the correct way to conceptualize warranties is that they're costly signals that vendors can send. Um, so here we have a peacock, which has this beautiful tail. But this is kind of a non-functional adaption. It doesn't help it forage for food. It doesn't help it escape predators. So evolutionary theory asks, well, why does this exist? Why do peacocks create this beautiful but costly non-functional tail? And the answer evolutionary theory would suggest is that it allows the peacock to send a costly signal that it can successfully forage for food, and you know it's a healthy bird. Um, and it's a very similar situation for software vendors, sorry, for InfoSec vendors. So this is a paper from 2018. It has a horrific amount of math in it. So I'll just provide you with a very kind of concise summary. 
um, which is that warranties are costlier for vendors of insecure software. As you can imagine, once you've offered the warranty, you're exposed to uncertainty. If your customers suffer many breaches, you have to pay out many times. So the more secure and the more effective your product is, the less you have to pay out. And that's what I mean when I say that it's a costlier signal to send if you're an insecure vendor. So this, at least in theory, suggests that warranties are a really good way for vendors to signal that they have a more effective product. And kind of the problem here is always theory, empirics, kind of the state of the world. They never quite match up. But we can do a kind of test here. Um, it's imperfect, and yeah, as an academic, there are kind of many issues I have with this, but it is very interesting to see that in the endpoint protection space, buyers report much higher satisfaction with the products sold with a warranty attached. And there could be reasons for that. It could be that those vendors have a slick marketing team, and that improves satisfaction. I'm not saying this is the perfect study, but it at least supports this intuition that cyber warranties are a way to signal that you have a more effective product. Yeah, OK. So the second issue was that cyber warranties are sales tricks. And I think this has a lot more, um, yeah, there's a lot more truth in this. So some of those limits can be a bit deceptive. So that $5 million limit, this was offered by a backup provider. It actually falls if the client doesn't buy, you know, if they're not backing up a lot of data. So this is maybe a small way. Um, another way, if you go to the business hall and you ask some of those vendors about their cyber warranties, some of them will say that they never actually paid out. Their claim is that this is a sign that their product is effective, it managed to prevent the incidents. But we all know of those vendors, there have been incidents when clients have yeah, installed their software. And one of the issues is that these warranties can be defined in quite a narrow way. And it only covers a kind of small set of the risk. Um, but in some sense, that is yeah, justifiable. So for instance, one of the providers of application security testing, what their warranty, the way it's structured, is really interesting. It says, we will pay out if the vulnerability is related to a known vulnerability. So if someone finds a vulnerability that can be linked to a CVE that was known at the time of the audit, but we won't pay out on zero day um, vulnerabilities that are discovered in the software. And this intuitively seems like the right way of setting it up. It's not really the security auditor's fault if a sophisticated threat actor finds a new vulnerability. Um, so it's just a way of kind of scoping the guarantee. Um, the other area it's potentially interesting is that often these warranties require the client to implement a bunch of different things. So again, whenever you try and put contractual language on a slide, it looks disgusting. Um, but here we have, this is an extract from um, one of the vendor's um, warranties. And you know, a lot of this stuff is good stuff. You would want the client to kind of be doing this stuff. So in a way, they're pushing the client towards configuring and implementing the product in the right way. So this is where I think it gets difficult. Yes, in a sense, they're sales tricks. Maybe you're not getting the coverage that you thought you were. But also, it's kind of understandable in another way. So yeah, like all good stories, we can have cliff notes. So since the first warranty, that should say Black Hat 2023. I'm not a time traveler. Um, an extra 15 warranties have been introduced. And I think, actually, if I did the analysis again, I'd find a lot more, um, maybe another five. Um, yeah, in the endpoint protection space, a quarter of all products are now offered with a warranty. We have some preliminary evidence that they're a costly signal of the effectiveness of a product. But of course, we kind of need to pay attention to the terms and conditions. So the next two takeaways are here. I kind of just stated them. But this is the section of the talk where we return to the initial idea about designing software liability regimes and what we can learn from these lessons and the story of cyber warranties. Um, and at the end of this, actually, I don't think I mentioned it, you can fill out a survey to kind of collect your perspectives if this is thought provoking. So I'm not here to kind of tell you I have the answers. I'm trying to explain to you 
oh, yeah, that's also a kind of typical academic point. I know that this room is not like the most representative sample, but I still think there's a lot of power in this room as a kind of point of authority to speak from. Um, but what I want to do in this part of the talk is explain to you the design space for the software liability regime, the kind of parameters that need to be set. So the first is this question of how prescriptive it is. You can imagine, this is what I showed the first time, a safe harbor that follows this very kind of checkmark list that says if you implement these 10 checklist items, then you will be immune. The benefit of this is it gives software vendors a lot of certainty. They know if they can just check these items off, then they are immune from liability. But of course, the kind of downside is it's inflexible, and there's always issues with checkbox compliance. One option would be to shift up kind of a layer of abstraction and look to instead a development framework. So there's various secure software development frameworks that a vendor could follow. And it could be that as long as they follow one of those frameworks, they're immune from liability. And then the final one, this is more in line with, for instance, the general data protection regulation in the European Union, is where you don't mandate specific controls, you don't mandate frameworks. Instead, you just say, well, follow a broad principle like secure by design. I think Derek, Professor Derek Bambauer at the University of Arizona has a really interesting idea, which is instead of saying, you are by default liable, and you become immune by doing these good practices. Um, Professor Bambauer's idea is instead reverse that. So say you are by default immune from liability, and you only become liable if you do certain quote unquote bad practices. So it could be hard coding passwords. Um, yeah. So this, this is another, another kind of dimension here. Another topic is just which areas of security should go into this framework. So you can imagine one focused narrowly on the kind of development practices of developers. So this is things like, I don't know, using a secure programming language or having threat modeling when you're first designing the project. Or you could go through to broader infosec um, requirements. So for instance, if they're offering software as a service, maybe you also want to understand the resilience of the provider, how they protect their network. These are all kind of areas that are up to discussion. Another consideration is whether there should be this one universal software um, liability regime, or if we actually want to tailor it for lots of different industries. So you can think of, for instance, the difference between healthcare, where there's patient data at risk, there's also yeah, big costs if there's um, a security failure that results in care facilities going down. Compare that to online gaming. For some people, it's a critical national um, kind of industry. But maybe here, we prefer to have a looser regime that allows people to innovate faster. So there's always kind of this trade-off between having a stricter regime that maybe pushes vendors to be more secure and having a looser regime that um, facilitates innovation. There's also this core problem about open source software. So if you have a group of developers who collectively work on a project that's published under an open source license, what should happen in that case? Who is liable? I think most sensible people agree that, um, yeah, that there should be an exception for open source software. But it does raise the question of when kind of modern software development is very complex. People are importing software libraries, embedding SaaS microservices. And actually, in a complex system, it can be difficult to determine where the kind of cause of the failure was and who to assign liability to. Um, and then finally, like kind of most legal regimes, at some point, people have to prove either way. So if to hold someone accountable, you need some form of evidence to show that they failed to meet the safe harbor or they didn't. And um, so all of this needs to be done with some kind of eye towards what we can actually prove. So that goes back to the first point about how prescriptive it is. Potentially, that checkbox compliance allows the vendor to prove they, were, they had implemented the safe harbor more easily than you know, some of the more abstract ones. So yeah, in terms of key takeaways, I think the first is just that liability changes the incentives to develop more secure software. Um, 
even without the mandatory regime, which given the state of kind of regulation in the US and the, sorry, legis legislative process, it's always gonna be hard to pass legislation here. Even despite that, in the InfoSec space, more vendors are offering warranties. Um, there's kind of preliminary evidence that this allows vendors to signal something about their product. We would like to think it's effectiveness, but maybe it's just customer satisfaction. And then the final point is that designing this safe harbor is a hard technical problem and it needs technical expertise. So thank you everyone for listening to the talk. I know there was also a very interesting one about the Viasat hack. Um, so thanks for coming to my talk. If you're interested in you know, providing your perspective, if these questions yeah, motivated you, feel free to scan this. It will link to a Qualtrics survey that allows you to pro provide kind of your insights. And depending on how many people fill this out, I hope to kind of write this up and feed it back into, for instance, um, some kind of, there's gonna be a symposium about software liability next year in 2024, and it would be really cool to present the results of the cyber warranties together with your perspectives as a way to kind of speak, um, yeah, from the authority of the room. So yeah, thank you for the talk. Feel free to reach out to me at either of these institutions. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, so one, were you able to collect data or will you be able to collect data on what warranties have actually been paid out? And two, it seems if you're saying, you didn't just say they were correlated, you said they achieve. Were you able to, com or can you, in future, to, to extend the research, look at the customer rating before they issued the warranty and a year after, and just see if there was a difference in the rating after, after the rating was? Yeah. So I thought if I present at an industry conference, I wouldn't be asked the technical methodological questions. Um, yeah, this is not causal evidence. It's not a super type research design. I think potentially if I partnered with Gartner, I could look at the reviews longitudinally, but I just scraped them from the website, so I can't answer that. The first question was, oh yeah, about payouts, really interesting one. So like I said, I spoke to, um, for instance, CrowdStrike yesterday. They would say they didn't, they've never paid out on their warranty. I know also Sentinel-1 are potentially not paying out so much. Um, I spoke to one of the providers of the MDR warranty, and they said they're paying out more often. And here I think it's interesting because, um, sorry, MSP. MSP providers have a much broader scope, and I think naturally then the scope of the warranty expands, and that means that they're having to pay out more frequently, whereas the CrowdStrike and Sentinel-1 warranties are very narrow, and they're kind of linked to implementing the technology properly, and that's allowed them to kind of escape paying out. And where do you see um, uh, warranties uh, working with uh, cyber insurance policies in terms of like who wants to, like when you file a claim with the cyber insurance first and it doesn't cover a product if it has a warranty or something like that? Yeah, so it's a really good question. I think it's open at the moment how exactly that, that will work out. Um, so, I mean, I guess, like this, this isn't a new problem in insurance. Like quite often you will get the same coverage under two different policies. So for instance, crime coverage often covers funds transfer fraud and so will a cyber insurance policy. And there they basically have to split the costs between the two warranties, sorry, between the two insurance policies. And I think it's similar here. There's no way the insurer can say your policy has been invalidated by the warranty. So, um, they, they definitely, you can get coverage from the warranty and then the cyber insurance policy. I think right now what's gonna be difficult as things emerge is like working out the coordination because one thing cyber insurers really want to do is ensure you work with a panel provider who they've approved and maybe the warranty provider also wants that and it creates potential um, yeah, discrepancies. So I think then could be that the InfoSec providers and the insurers need to work together to kind of line them up but I, I think it's an open problem at the moment. Uh, do you think that there's room to address like some of the it, breaches we've seen in, recently, like with MoveIt, uh, 3CX, SolarWinds, to kind of like prove that software is secure? You don't have to worry about that sort of thing. But like, 
how do you think vendors are going to be able to approach that? Because something like Move It could have potentially bankrupted a company if they were actually held liable uh, by contract. Yeah, so it's us useful to, to hear differentiate. All the warranties I've introduced are from InfoSec vendors who have you know, introduced, they're basically adding bolt-on security solutions. The examples you provided were traditional software vendors. Um, I think, like realistically, those vendors have no incentive to offer a warranty. Most buyers are, yeah, unable to dis distinguish between a secure VPN and an insecure VPN. A really good example at Coalition, our 2023 claims report showed that um, policyholders with Fortinet-facing device, internet-facing Fortinet devices, were three times more likely to make a claim, 300%. Um, and most of our policyholders are small organizations who just can't distinguish between secure and insecure software. And I just don't think it's in their business model to begin to poke this beast. I think for those vendors who are just trying to sell software, I think it's going to have to come from the government. Um, I think they just have no incentive to become liable at the moment. I was just curious if um, the auto industry has anything similar to the safe harbor um, thing that you were pointing out earlier? It's a really good question. I just don't have the answer. Um, I mean, a lot of it kind of happens informally through best practice. So a lot of liability regimes have ideas around kind of implementing best practice. And it kind of emerges through just the industry working together to define what safety is. And then if an organization or a manufacturer fails to do what the industry describes, um, then you know, they're potentially negligent. So I don't, I don't have a really good answer, no. I, I Maybe you do. I, no, I don't. I, I thought it was interesting to use that, that analogy because I use it as, as well. Um, but you think about like Toyota years ago having problems with brakes or mm -hmm. acceleration or whatever, and like they recall millions of cars because they take it very, very seriously. Whereas the security vendors, they don't care. <laughs> it doesn't seem they don't seem to care. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that's where the liability regime has kind of two benefits. One is the direct victim has gets compensation, and the second is more indirect. It's that it creates the incentives to build a safe car or build secure software because the recall is just so expensive. Um, yeah. But sorry, I can't really answer the question directly. So we have a few more minutes. And if not, um, yeah, I would like to just thank you all for attending the talk. And I will be around if you want to ask a question, kind of one-to-one. -one. 